Hi, folks, and uh, my name is Jeff de Beaujardier, uh, Director of the Information Systems Division in CISL. Welcome to the first in-person CISL seminar in this room since COVID started. So this is great. <laughs> uh, thank you for, for coming. And I know there's other, we are broadcasting online, so hopefully people out there can also hear. Um, our speaker today is Richard Lawrence, specializing in supercomputing architecture. Richard is accountable for the technical design, implementation, and future direction of one of the world's largest supercomputers dedicated to weather and climate research. As a program architect for the Met Office's Supercomputer 2020 Plus program, he led the work on the data center, connectivity, and scientific compute environment packages, and oversaw the requirement capture and design of the active data archive, expected to handle one petabyte of data per day, wow, with a capacity of four exabytes. He has recently become also a principal fellow for technology. He holds a Master's of Engineering and Software Engineering at Aberystwyth University, I asked how to pronounce it, I think I just got it wrong, and is a chartered engineer and chartered IT professional. Rich, and we're going to hold the questions to the end, people online, put them in Slido, and Tejo will read them out. Uh, hello, and thank you for coming today, and thank you for allowing me to, to talk to you about what we've been up to at the Met Office with our supercomputing and data, data programs. Um, Hopefully you'll, you'll find it exciting. We certainly do. Um, we see it as a once in a generational shift in how we're dealing with our, our computing. Um, and we, we did it um, essentially because we saw some um, crossroads coming up in the, in, in the industry and we were particularly worried about our um, internal data center infrastructure and not being able to cope with the demands in the, in the future. And the... Um, the cloud um, was was one option to help to help solve that. So um, yeah, so a little bit about the Met Office. We're a little different to a lot of the other national Met services around around the world, in that we've got responsibility for both doing both weather and climate um, simulations. We're part of government. We also have a commercial angle to us as well, so we're expected to engage in commercial activities and return a profit back to the UK, UK government. Um, we've had a long history of being involved in the um, UK military. In fact, that's why we were set up. We were involved in the, in the D-Day landings and trying to forecast what was the, the correct data to, um, for those to go ahead. Um, and we do a lot of work internationally through um, both through the World Meteorological Organization, some of our own programs, um, such as WISER, where we're trying to, uh, to do weather and climate work with predominantly um, uh, countries that um, are part of the UK, UK com and uh, global commonwealth. Um, so the UK Met Office is all about helping people make better decisions to stay safe and thrive. And we do that through, um, through free lenses. It's, it's about um, having excellent people and culture who can help push that, those decisions to stay safe and thrive. It's about developing exceptional science and technology and, and operations, but doing that to get extraordinary impact and benefit. There's no point in us doing the science if it's not having an impact and wider benefit to the, to the world. And we do that through three time horizons. So horizon A, essentially over the next year, stuff that we know how to do and we're, we're working actively on, focused in on, on certain elements. Horizon B, essentially years two to, to five years out, where we know what we would like to do, but we don't necessarily know quite how to, how to do it yet. Um, and stuff is a bit more exp experimental and we can take different options. And then horizon C, the potential, things we don't absolutely don't know how to do and we're experimenting with. And this is um, tied into the second generation of, um, of our, our supercomputer and, and beyond. The last thing I'm going to describe about how the Met Office likes to see itself is um, we have um, sorts of two elements to the Met Office. One which we call the, the national capability. That's what you'd expect any sort of national Met service and climate organization to sort of do. And that's around collecting observations, doing simulations and predictions, and then providing analysis upon that to provide data and expert advice based on that, that um, analysis and simulation. 
We then have another arm to the, the organisation that develops that data and advice into products and services that people can use to help make those de decisions. And we quite explicitly want to keep a, a sort of boundary in the, in the organisation so that we know what is part of the, the national capability and what's, what's to do with products and services that could be more tailored to individual, individual customers. So you wanted me to talk about supercomputing today. So let's let's talk a little bit about what we currently do with, with supercomputing. We have three main supercomputing systems at the, the Met Office, um, two of which are located in the basement of our, our Exeter HQ building. Um, there are two operational machines. Um, they're Cray um, XE machines, both around three petaflops. Um, and have roughly 100,000 cores of Haswell and Broadwell in, Intel chips in, in them. We got them, I believe, around 2014, 2015. Um, and the way they work is they work in an operational pair. So at any one point, one will be running our operational weather forecast and climate predictions. If that fails, we switch over to the other, the other machine, which is generally running research work and, and gap filling in the, in the meantime. And then over the motorway, we have another supercomputer, uh, which we call XCS, um, which is the same size as those other two combined. And that's purely used for research work and collaboration. We don't run any operations on, on that machine at, at all. Um, one thing we do, particularly with our supercomputers, is we don't name them. Um, we, uh, yeah, we have a big thing about not, not naming them um, because it really helps us with our um, government owners to sort of demonstrate that it's just a tool for us. And if we had another tool that could do the job just as well, then we would switch to that tool. It so happens there isn't another tool at the moment and we have to use these supercomputers. But so we, yeah, we, we um, make a big deal out of, out of not naming our supercomputers. Um, this is the, um, that third machine. Um, it's in a dark data center. We don't allow anybody into, the, into this data center. Um, I think when it was announced, it was in the number 11 and the top 500 spot. Um, it's, it's been a great machine for us. It's getting a little long in the tooth now, seven years old for um, a semi-operational supercomputer. It's, it's quite good going, um, we're, but we're very keen to, to move off it. Um, it's certainly very full. Um, we have a, a queue the size of, um, of I don't know what, but um, our scientists are, are clamoring to get onto to a new machine and, and get some more capacity. So supercomputing 2022 um, plus, um, we had some aims that we wanted to, to work towards. So it's got to be able to keep our UK expertise at the forefront of global weather and cli climate science. Um, and a lot of that is around expanding the capacity and capability of those, those machines. Um, we want to further inform our understanding and analysis of, of cli climate change. So that's allowing us to do the analysis on that data we're producing on that supercomputer. And critically for us, um, a big thing is that impact and benefit and being able to produce warnings to help enhance the, the UK resilience. Um, so I was actually one of the developers that developed our National Sphere Weather Warning System. So on the TV screen, we get our weather forecasters pointing out where there's going to be significantly um, impactful areas of, of weather. And that's a big part of the service we, we provide to the public. And to do that, um, we went and asked um, central government for um, some money. We don't automatically get funding to replace our, our supercomputers. We have to go ask central government to, um, to, to replace them. Um, and when we went and did this, we looked at our existing estate and realized we'd run out of power, cooling, and space to host a new, a new supercomputer. So we knew we were going to have to host them outside of our, our extra data centers. Um, we also, when we did that, we went and looked at other data center providers and they said, your kit is quite specialized. We're gonna to have to build some infrastructure specifically for you. And that's gonna cost money. Um, and if you come and use our data center for five years, we're just gonna charge you the amount of money that um, it costs us to build that infrastructure. And it would not typically take us 10 years to recover that amount of money. So you may as well go for a 10 year contract with us. Otherwise, we're just gonna charge you the same in five years. 
So that was a bit eye-opening for us. We also then, no, normally we go and ask government for like 100 million pounds as a capital investment for a supercomputer. But then by the time you add in all the power costs, the people costs, the running costs of that machine, typically we're spending about 250 million pounds on, on the supercomputers. And then if we're going out for 10 years instead of five years, and we're also going out for a data archive at the same time, we realized this isn't in the same level of funding as what we normally go out, out, go out for. So what we actually went out and asked for was a 1.2 billion pound investment, which when you're going from 100 million pounds ask to 1.2 billion pounds ask is a significant step and um, certainly got their attention as to why we were asking for a lot more money. But the thing that really helped us in this is that we were able to demonstrate through our um, working with our economists that we we're expecting to deliver a return of um, 14 to 1, essentially, or just under, um, and 13.7 billion pounds back to the UK economy in socioeconomic benefits. So that doesn't mean that the Met Office has got to write a cheque for 13.7 billion pounds to, to the UK government, but we believe the work through the supercomputer and getting that data and products out to other people in the, in the UK, that will enhance the UK economy by 13.7 billion pounds. And we're actually pretty conservative in that estimate. We actually dial it back every time there's an opportunity to make sure we're, we're likely to hit that target. And we're on track to, to deliver these, these benefits at the, at the moment. Another uh, sort of problem we've, we've got in, in this space is we've got our existing U, UM model and it's based on a, a lat long grid and we subdivide that around the world and create re regional models. Um, we're actually running into some of the limits of that, that model, specifically around the poles. Um, we're, I think we're forecasting every two meters now at the, um, the North and South Poles, but I don't know about you, but I don't think polar bears and penguins need that sort of level of accuracy in their, their weather forecast. Um, and it's, it's obviously using a huge amount of computation to, to do that. So we want to look at new series of models that can help solve that um, uh, pole problem and also allow us to move away from our dependence on uh, CPU-based architectures. So we're working on something we call the next generation modeling systems, which allows us to move to a semi or unstructured grid, um, allows us to decompose our, um, our models into separate parts so that we can separate our physics code from our computational code, and allow our physicists to write the physics code, and our computational scientists to take that physics code and make it run efficiently on lots of different architectures. We're, and we're doing that using a DSL approach to essentially take the Fortran code, munge it about a bit, and output some slightly different Fortran code sprinkled with, with annotations where appropriate. Um, and we're doing that in that simulation block that I, I showed up earlier inside the, the national capability. Um, I already mentioned that we're looking to move away from this lat long grid to we're, we're looking to go to a cube sphere mesh, so a semi-structured um, grid, um, and switch over to using a, a mixed finite element method. And we're looking to do that towards the end of our generation one machine, so within the next um, around 2025, 20, 2026 20, timeframes, so that we're operational using this next generation model before we switch to our generation two um, systems on the supercomputer. The last um, sort of bit of background of some of our challenges is we have a, um, a very big data challenge. And by very big data, I mean we're currently generating about 300 terabytes of data a day. Um, we've got an archive of about 300 petabytes. We're moving 40 terabytes of that data we produce every day into AWS. So we're moving 40 terabytes into the cloud. That's a significant amount to put in, be putting into the cloud each day. We're expecting that to grow to 200 terabytes next year. And by the time we get to our second generation of supercomputer, that's going to be between half a petabyte and a petabyte of data we're moving into AWS um, each day. So that's a significant challenge. Um, it takes time to move data. It costs to move data. Um, yeah, we don't like doing it, but we feel we need our data to be where our consumers are. And we don't feel we can dictate where that place is. 
to our consumers. So although we're going to be um, doing stuff in, in various different clouds, we have to make sure it's wherever our consumers are um, so that they can make best use of that data. I mentioned our, our archive. It's a tape-based system, um, yeah, 300 petabytes. Um, it's a brilliant system. We, we love our, our um, tape archive. Um, I think the 300 petabytes works out to be every movie ever produced on Blu-ray 20 times over. So yeah, it's a, a significant um, amount of data. We do a lot of work with our um, scientists in pruning that data and removing as much as, as possible. Um, we do do significant culls that get rid of petabytes of data at a, a time, but we like to keep a, a large amount of that, that data. We never know what, which bits of the data we produce is going to be useful in, in X, year, X year's time. And, and the archive is part of our, um, of our procurement that we went out for for the 1.2 billion pounds. So our approach to doing supercomputing is that we typically replace them every five years or so. That's roughly where the sort of like the break even point is on efficiency versus versus cost although that's extending out now um, like I said we've been we've had ours for seven years now we typically procured our data archives separately and we bought all of our smaller computers separately and we hosted everything on site so everything was something that we had to integrate ourselves and get it all to to work together um, it's typically easier to get um, government excited about a supercomputer than it is about a data archive um, and all the other little bits and pieces around the, the outside and improving how we want to output our data. A, tip, a supercomputer is quite big and flashy and a politician quite likes to stand in front of a ribbon and, and cut it. So it's um, we tend to associate a lot of our stuff with the, the supercomputer because that's then um, something that um, we get a lot of people on board with. I've already mentioned a lot of our, our challenges, um, the power requirements site. Because we're buying five years out, you tend to need to think about power further than five years out, otherwise you're just buying for the next system. And that's the problem we were constantly running into, is that we weren't able to invest for the system after the next one. So it, you're, you're constantly in this game of catch up, of trying to build the power infrastructure you need for a system that you don't actually have yet. Um, and that was quite tricky to get that, that investment. Um, our electrical infrastructure is also pretty old now. It's about 15 years old. It needs to be replaced. But we're at the limits of what we're supporting. So we've only got 400 kilowatts of spare capacity. You can't replace kit whilst it's all being being used very, very easily with not being allowed any, any downtime for the operational systems. So that was a, an issue for us. We also feel like we're on this constant procurement conveyor belt, that we're constantly going out to buy a new machine and, and work up the, the next one. So we wanted to get away from that. So we were after a new approach. We wanted a fully managed service delivery model. We didn't want to be a supercomputing center anymore. We want to be a weather and climate center who happens to use some supercomputers. To do that, we wanted to work with a world-class technology partner that could take on that supercomputing load for, from us. And we needed around the clock 24 by 7 support for that to enable our operations to, to continue. I mentioned that procurement conveyor belt. It's a five-year cycle for us. So we use a computer for about a year, and then we go out and look at all the various different companies that are in the supercomputing space for a year and go talk to them all, find out what they're going to be doing in the next few years and what we might be able to buy. Then it takes us a year to get government approvals. We have to go to lots of various different apartments to get them to, to agree and say yes. Once we've got their approval, it takes us a year to actually talk to the vendors and buy something. And then it takes us a year to install it and convert all of our codes over to it. So then we get a spare year of actually using the computer and then we have to kick it all off again. So it's really expensive for us to be doing this constantly and we tie up a load of people who are pretty clever and we want them to be doing other things, um, essentially just buying supercomputers. So that's why we looked to move to this 10 year model that gave us a bit more breathing space in, in effect. So the early market engagement, who do we speak to? We'll speak to anybody. 
anybody who um, who wants to know about what we're up to in supercomputing and has got a slightest chance of um, being able to deliver us um, something in, in that space. Um, we were very conscious that it's a shrinking market. Um, uh, when we were um, looking to go out, Cray still existed as a separate entity. They've since been swallowed by, by HPE. Um, there's a, a, yeah, a shrinking number of uh, top class supercomputing providers out there in the world. And we were very conscious of this. So when we went and did our procurement, we wanted to make it open to as wide as a, a number of technology vendors as possible. And so that got us thinking that actually the cloud vendors, we don't quite believe are in our space yet and are, um, are doing supercomputing, but they're getting there and we want to get them used to um, working with us in this procurement environment and um, we want to make it open so that they can compete on a, a level playing field with the more traditional vendors. So we set up our procurement to allow that to happen. Um, I mentioned it takes about a year to get government approval. And that's because we have to talk to about five or six different departments, all have got a different interest in, in us. So our owning department is the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. We have to convince them first that we need a supercomputer and the amount of money we'd like to go for and it's gonna be useful and what benefit it's going to um, have back to, to the UK. We've then got to go ask the people with the money which is the Treasury. Um, they have a different set of requirements for um, what they see as, as good value for money for, for investment. Um, and yet yeah, they're the ultimate people who hand over the money and, and can say go. Cabinet office are essentially the central of, uh, office of government that look after all the other departments and set the, the general direction of, of government and they like to have a say. Um, by the time it gets down to the pointy end of you making announcements that you're going to spend this amount of money, um, 10 Downing Street typically like to um, get involved and, and take notice and depending on what's going on at the, the time, they might want to make that, that announcement and you might have to fit in with, with their calendar of, of um, what's going on in, in the UK at that time. And because we're looking to spend this amount of, of money, um, government doesn't just trust you to hand over that amount of money and, and go on and, and spend it wisely. They want you, uh, they make you be part of um, a major projects portfolio where they're looking at what you're doing with that money, making sure it's on track, it's being spent wisely and you're delivering the benefits that you, you said you would. So that, that involves a whole different level of gov governance and, and governance, which is, which is great um, it, to see that, yeah, when you are spending this, this amount of money, the government do take it very seriously, that you're providing good value for money back to the UK taxpayer. Um, those approvals, um, to get them, you have to write a business case. Um, and not just one business case, you actually end up writing 15 business cases. Um, so um, on the right hand side there, you start off by writing a strategic outline case and it has five different lenses. So a strategic case, an economic case, a commercial case, a financial case and a man management case. Then you have to take that and you have to develop it to the next level of detail and shift focus slightly in, in it. And then once you know what you actually want um, and who you want it to, to go to, you have to develop a final business case, which then is the final point where they give you the money and, and say, yes, award a contract to whichever vendor you've, you've done your procurement to. So yeah, 15 business cases, it, it takes quite a while, um, but we're pretty good at writing them now. So. <laughs> um, the procurement, the procurement landed right over COVID, um, which was actually fantastic for the people doing the um, procurement evaluation, because we were thought we were gonna have to be locked away in a part of the office and not allow anybody in to look at the files we were looking at. And in fact, we did it all at home and that solved that problem. And actually um, it enabled us to have longer conversations with our lawyers, which is a good thing. Um, but um, we wouldn't have been able to end up with the same contract we did if we were spending all of our time, one party of us going up and down on trains the, the whole time. So actually the remote working worked really, really well for, for us for the year that we were, we were doing this. Um, we had six packages of requirements, 450 requirements in, in total. It generally costs a vendor 
about a million pounds to respond, or between half a million and a million pounds to respond to 100 requirements. So this is a serious undertaking for, for a vendor. They're going to be spending a serious amount of money with no guarantee that they're going to be end up with a, the contract. So we took this very seriously. We, um, we didn't want to mess any, anybody around. Um, we had to make sure it was a fair and open, open competition. Um, we put 30 of our, our top experts on it for, for a year. Um, this was all the documentation that we had to read and generate. Um, they, somebody decided it would be funny to um, put it in the form of a, a cray. Um, we did our procurement slightly differently. We do something called competitive dialogue. Because basically, the first time you get a response back from a vendor, it's not actually what you want. Um, and it's, it's going to have holes in it, and it's going to not quite meet what you actually were, uh, um, were after. Because either they've misunderstood what you're asking for, or you've misunderstood how your words were going to be interpreted. So we do something called competitive dialogue that allows you to go and speak to the vendors and in dialogue talk about what works and what hasn't worked. And um, you can't tell them a solution that you want them to go to, but you can um, absolutely um, tell them where you have concerns about bits of their, bits of their solution. Um, so that was quite intensive. Um, you have set periods of, periods of time where you can talk to each of the, the vendors, and they can ask clarification questions. And you've got to write your notes in certain places in certain ways. We spent a lot of time working with lawyers, um, uh, which, which is great. We learned a lot. I'm, I'm probably one of the most um, uh, legal savvy technical people we have now in the, in the organization because the lawyers have trained me to work in a particular way um, and it, it was fascinating. Um, at the end of all this we ended up with a new strategic collaboration between us and Microsoft. Um, it, like I said it's a, a 10 year deal. It's a first for them. It's a first, we think, for the industry to, to have something of, of this sort of size and scale with a, with a cloud provider. Um, and it's, it just sort of happened, basically. Um, we, we, didn't, um, we left the procurement open so that this wasn't, was an option, but we didn't go and seek this. Um, it, we would have been perfectly happy with a more traditional vendor being in the, this space as well. But we are now really excited that Microsoft are our, our partner out for the next 10 years in the, in the supercomputing space. We weren't so sure when we initially were doing the procurement that um, uh, cloud was particularly the way to go. And the reason being, this is our output from our UK model, one, one and a half kilometer over, over the UK. It's got no information about um, coastlines or orography, but you can clearly see that's the UK there, and you can clearly see that there are mountains in, in part, parts of the, the country. Um, and I really apologize for this, because this is me as a technologist butchering this diagram rather than a scientist doing it properly. But this is an approximation of our 10 kilometer global data. So you can still see the UK is there, and it's, it's close to France, and you can still see the coastline and the, the mountains. And that's what we output for our global model each, each day. This is what we were going to be able to get from a cloud vendor five years ago in, in the cloud. And I don't know about you, but the UK is there. <laughs> But it might be in France, it might be somewhere else in the world, we don't know. Um, and that, that was, the, we felt, the state of um, cloud supercomputing about five years ago. We think it's changed. We think they can do pretty much what the traditional vendors now can do up to certain scales. Certainly 10,000 cores um, plus, they can get equivalent performance out to um, what we were able to do in-house. In, in so what did we actually end up with Microsoft? Um, we ended up with a contract that allowed us to get two generations of supercomputing, refreshed after the first, first five years. Those first five years are HPE Cray machines in Microsoft data centers. It pretty much looks like what we've got now. We've got all of our HP, HPC admins doing the same kind of work in the same kind of way. It's just the Cray engineers who were replacing bits of hardware in our data center are now doing it in Microsoft's data center. 
And that's a really easy ramp into the cloud. I mean, we get all the um, cloud goodness. It's tied into their Azure background. Um, the, a load of the other parts aren't um, a dedicated kit, but it is dedicated kit for us for that supercomputing for the first five years. In 2027, there's a break point. Um, we built into the contract the ability to refresh all the kit, and we didn't say what, what it was going to be. We gave an indication we wanted it to be three times greater performance than what we're getting in generation one. So that's 18 times what we've, we've got now. But we didn't say how they were to do that or what exactly that looked like. We actually didn't say it had to be three times because we didn't know that was possible. We gave an indication and we built into the, um, the contract a mechanism where Microsoft proposed back what they're going to give us in 2027. We look at it, we decide whether we think it's good value for money. And if we don't, then we have a discussion and there's a way to arbitrate if we really both don't agree as to whether it's good value for money or not. But there's, we felt that was a reasonable compromise to essentially specifying enough about what we want in a technology landscape where you can't predict what's happening five years out, but giving us enough control to say, yeah, we're happy with this or, or not. It's based in the south of the UK in Microsoft's data centers. Um, it's um, supply, supplied by renewable en energy sources. Um, we didn't take Rego certificates as um, evidence of this. We didn't think that was good enough. We wanted Microsoft to be able to point to the wind farm or the solar farm or whatever source and say, that's where your electricity is um, coming from. And they did that and it was, um, it was very good of them. Um, and yet it's not just a supercomputer, it's a fully managed service. So they're having to supply all the power, all the, um, the people supporting the, the system. We're also doing our mass archive um, and other clusters, the networking into that, that um, supercomputer, all the data movement around is included in this in this contract. It's all in basically. So how does it look? Well, we've essentially asked for four quadrants. We've split our supercomputer into four, and the reason why we want to do that is, whenever we patch the supercomputers, we wanted to keep the blast radius as small as possible and affect the fewest number of scientists. We also do collaboration work, so we give 10% of our machine over to UK academic users to do work related to weather, weather and climate on it. We don't want those users on the same machine that we're running operational forecasts for the UK military. It's not okay to do that. So we, we keep them separate. So they have part of quadrant D, um, our operational forecasts run on some of the other quadrants, and it could be any of those quadrants on any particular day, and we move it around depending on various different conditions. Um, so that's in two um, UK zones, um, greater than 10 kilometers apart, that's far better than the 100 meters they are apart in our basement. Um, we also have our mass archive, so we've moved away from our on-premise tape archive system to a fully cloud-native um, um, archive. Microsoft have taken all of our software, ripped it up, and gone, no, we're going to write it in using cloud-native components. Um, this was the bit we were most worried about, um, but actually it's the bit that's gone fantastically well. Um, we're keeping our command line client interface so our scientists don't have to change any of their scripts to access the archive. It's just behind the scenes. It's now using Azure Blob and other technologies um, to be as performant or better perf better performing than our current archive system and in far greater scale. Um, the other advantage we get from that mass system is we now get three copies of our data spread around the, the region not two copies in our basement. Um, we're much more resilient to um, all sorts of disasters happening now as well, which is great. Um, all the connectivity between those various different um, data centers between us and, intriguingly, they have to provide connectivity to AWS. Um, that was in the, the contract. We were very open about that because we want to continue sending our data into, a, into AWS because that's where some of our customers are and where we're currently um, developing all of our customer products and, and services. So that's a, a connectivity that, that they provide for us. Also out to the internet and to uh, Janet, the Janet networks. 
Um, I can't give you the specifics of those um, sizes of pipes, but there is lots of connectivity they're providing to, to us to allow that data to transfer to happen. Um, I talked about mass being completely cloud native, they, and they've um, ripped it apart and developed it all using different cloud technologies. Um, Microsoft are brilliant at this. They know their technology inside out. They really know how to make it sing. Um, it's doing really well, and it's the most exciting thing we're probably doing in the, in the cloud space at, at, at the moment. Um, once it goes live, we're going to be talking about this lots and lots in lots of different places. But it's, um, it's a really exciting project, um, and they've done fantastically well. Um, it's yeah, super scalable, super performant. Um, our, our scientists are finding it a joy to use, um, and we were really nervous about this when, when we were first doing it. Um, I want to end by giving a, a quick run through of our cloud journey, um, because we weren't always open to, to being quite so cloudy. Um, and typically we find, I mean, it starts with a server. You, somebody comes along and asks you to build a server, and it's, it's just one. And then they want a few more, so you build them a few more servers. And that would be great if that's what they all looked like and, and were, but they don't. They, in fact, look like this. They're all a little bit different, and some of them are really rare and special, and you don't quite know how they managed to build them like that but they're all doing something unique and, and different. And you're spending all your time obsessing about these various different variations and, and what they do. Um, and we were doing that using um, OpenStack, and that allowed us to, to do this brilliantly. But we sort of decided that the purpose of the Met Office is not really to build servers. We want to model the future. Um, by doing great weather science and, and operational weather, weather forecasting and climate science, so we sort of realized that we were probably operating at the wrong end of this, this stack, where we were too close to the physical hardware and, um, and virtualizing our, our own machines. And we wanted to get more to the right-hand side of this, where we were having to deal less with what was going on under the hood and spending more of our time developing the applications and the data that, that this was, was built on. So that was a conscious decision we, we took a few years ago. Ironically, we built a map of all the systems that we were going to move over to the cloud and when we were going to do it. And Supercomputer was on the right-hand side of that diagram saying, yeah, we're never moving that. That's our secret source. We're, uh, don't forget about that. Uh, all the other systems are going to go first. That's actually one of the ones that, that went first um, because we found a cloud supplier that was particularly interested in, in, in doing it. Um, our cloud partner of choice um, to, to help us do a lot of this um, cloud was, was AWS. We've got a great relationship with AWS. Um, they're really innovative and, and help us to, to expand what we do in our, our customer and, and data space. Um, and this was sort of one of the, our mottos and, and driving things by, behind us. And it's, um, charities are really great at expressing these in a really easy to uh, understand way. Um, we only want to solve our hard problems. We don't want to solve somebody else's hard, hard problems. And we want to get out of the way of our engineers and scientists to allow them to do their hard problems. Um, and yeah, that's, that's what we've been trying to do. The reason why is because these are diagrams of our, uh, um, our estate. This one is affectionately known as the rat's nest. Um, Data gets from the top of the diagram out to the customer at the bottom, but nobody really knows how. <laughs> um, it's certainly not in one person's head. Um, and then the other diagram is looking at one system and where all the data goes from that system to all the other systems and all the data sets it uses. And um, nobody has got that in their, their heads. Um, and so to do that, we've partitioned up our organization. Um, if you think about it in the big chunks, we do observations, predictions, post-processing analysis, and then products and services. And we've allocated that to different um, clouds and, and companies where we're doing that work. So the big um, supercomputing spend, gone with Azure, um, in that prediction space. Um, there's a big question mark there, because we currently do our post-processing analysis on-premise. We don't know whether we should be doing that close to the supercomputer with analysis or close to our customers um, and move, moving the data about. So that's a big thing we're looking at at the, the moment. 
Um, and to do that, we're looking at how we do our analysis and developing something we're calling PRISM, which is going to be an analysis platform to allow essentially our scientists to easily move their work from when they're in research mode out into getting it into operations without them having to rewrite their Python scripts to what the technologists are comfortable supporting. Um, so yeah, that's what we're doing in, in that space. Thank you for listening to me today. And, yeah. Yes, online people, if you have any questions, please put them in Slido. I don't see any yet, so we're going to start with in-person questions. Who wants to go first? Okay. Thanks, Rich. This was uh, really fascinating. There's so much to learn. I'm hoping that we can get your slides later so I can go over it slower, too, and understand more. Um, I, I had two questions uh, off the bat. One is, you, you obviously have a lot of changes and you have a new process. Is, are there any lessons learned in this process that you would do differently next time? And uh, uh, that, that's, uh, that's the first one. Um, the second one is you, you mentioned a little bit about uh, things that have gone really well, like the mass uh, storage. Are there things that have not gone not so well and, and lessons learned from that? Yeah, so um, actually almost tying them to, together, the, the big things that we thought were easy have actually been some of the harder things and the little things that, um, that in fact, actually some of the little things that we thought were easy were actually the things that took, um, have taken a lot of the time. So um, it was, we over-specified some things, we under-specified others, basically. Um, so we had one requirement that dealt with, this is how we want you to interact with our service desk and help desk and integrate with our help desk system. That's taken us a long time to figure out the processes for who owns essentially an incident at any one point in time and at what point Microsoft take that over and what they need to do to send it back to our organization. That's been a huge amount of resource and, and effort and it was one requirement um, out of the, the 450. And yet we probably specified 200 requirements about individual bits of the, the supercomputer and what needs to be done to allow us to update the Python library to the latest, the latest version. So getting that balance right, we didn't quite do. One thing we absolutely did do is we moved away as far as we could from specifying specific technologies and things that we wanted to outcomes we wanted. And that allowed different vendors to give us the solution that they worked best for them and they felt worked best for us, instead of us going, we want that specific piece of technology here. And that, that was great because it, it gave us more it, flexible solutions that we weren't necessarily anticipating. Thanks, I really appreciate this. Couple, uh, the procurement that you just outlined, are those requirements available online? Is that part of a public RFP call that's still up somewhere? Um, so it was part of the um, uh, EU OJU system that they were made publicly available. We're, n we're not making them publicly available at the moment, but um, we can talk to individual organizations and expose them to those organizations, if that uh, makes sense. Um, uh, you, you talked about some very impressive data upload rates. How, what's, your, what's your volume, what's your footprint in cloud storage? How long do those data persist? Or what's your, your total high watermark of storage? Yeah, so um, it varies. So typically, the, that 40 terabytes I was talking about, we will generally persist that for about seven days. We will then create a two-year archive of some of that data, the bits that um, our customers specifically find very, very, very useful. Um, we're looking to optimize that at the, at the moment. We've not got the sweet spot quite right yet. Um, I don't know the exact numbers for what that translates to in the, in the cloud, but um, it's, yeah, it's a, a significant spend in, in terms of storage. One more, just from your, your casual user environment, are they interacting with the, the Azure stack or are they just SSH into a Cray as far as they are? Um, so the end users um, for our main supercomputers access it like they do now through command line, uh, well, P PBS for their, their scheduler and just execute jobs from their scientific desktop. 
Um, we've got a smaller cluster we call SPICE, which we allow people to do a lot more um, free work on, um, mostly for single node jobs. That's in this generation going to be Azure native HPC. Um, that we're letting people experiment with a lot more. So if they don't want to access it through the scheduler, it's potentially possible they could access it through Dask, through a Pangea instance, or all sorts of other ways. We're trying to use that cluster to get people familiar with using HPC in different ways so that when we come to generation two in 2027, we've got people used to using a cloud style HPC environment in a more open way. Hi, I was curious about your socioeconomic impact 14 to one. How, can you say more about how that number was arrived at? Yeah. So. Um, we worked with the London School of Economics to develop a load of um, ways of trying to judge the value that we get out of the, the supercomputer. And we do that for a number of different ways. We pick a load of case studies, essentially, in a number of different areas, and whether that's in aviation, hazards, climate impacts, or um, mil military uses. And then we go and find events that happen during the period we've got that um, supercomputer and say, if there are any blockers to us being better in, in those areas due to the, the supercomputer, what impact it had on the UK citizen. And then we, through the um, economists, extrapolate that out into both the next generation of, of supercomputer and what we'd be able to do if we were unhindered in, in that space. And like I say, we pull back at every opportunity that, that we can. So whether there's, um, when, yeah, when there's a, a reasonable spread of what those numbers could be, we take the most conservative value so that we're not over-egging our, our value back to the economy. Um, we've got um, a load of people who, who work in this space. They're always keen to talk to others who want to know how, how we did it within, within government. So we can certainly put them in contact with you. Just a reminder to those watching virtual to put your questions in Slido if you have any. So with this transition, what's your impact on your workforce? How is there, yeah, what's your plan around workforce and how does it change? So um, one thing Penny, our CEO, said when she came in and, and saw this program, she did not want to lose any of our skills in any of our areas. So she was not interested in a solution that meant our HPC admins were not doing the job that they are currently doing, doing now. And she didn't want to lose any people or any skills. We also wanted to make the transition for our scientists and users as easy as possible. So every point we could, we wanted to make it look like in the first instance, they were still using the kits that we have, have today. So that's why when Microsoft are rewriting the, the Mass and Moose system, all the commands have got to work exactly how they work now, even though the back end is completely different. They access the supercomputer in the, in the same way to minimize that, that journey. Then during that generation one, we're going to take our scientists and users on a journey to exposing them to more cloud-based um, um, systems so that essentially what we feel is there are going to be some users who are really keen and really want to get around the limits that we've imposed on them with their current supercomputer. And we're hoping that they will be the advocates that drive some of the other scientists into using some of these systems in, in new and novel ways. I have a more specific question around your next generation modeling system. You mentioned you use the DSL, and I think I'm, but you also mentioned you exploit other programming models. So what are, what are the other programming models you are exploiting? So um, we actually use our, our, um, our DSL to essentially hook into various different um, uh, annotations and, and architectures. So the first instance, we're doing some open MP work. We've hooked it into Cocos. Um, we're looking at yeah, uh, um, uh, CUDA. Um, we'll try and use whatever is appropriate to the architecture that we're looking to, to make use of. But we're limiting it to that DS cell being the bit that does the translation to those various different um, uh, programming um, uh, implementations so that we can keep that constrained to one part of the, the, the application code, essentially. And I think my last question, I mean, you have an uptime requirement with your production system. Yeah. Um, 
did you specify, I mean, how many nines or whatever uh, micro, because I think even the cloud goes, can go down, right? And then, yeah. so do you have these, these things specified? Yeah, we, we specified um, some KPIs um, based around various different things. So there's, if you take the four supercomputing quadrants as a whole, there's the ability to access any of those quadrants. So if they have one quadrant up, then they meet one of the KPIs. But if the other three are down, then they're, they're not meeting some of the other KPIs. We have the ability to run our operations as one of the KPIs. So as long as they've got two of the operation, uh, two operational quadrants up, then they meet certain other KPIs. Um, it, it essentially, um, there are penalties for them not, not meeting it. It's, the contract we have is a custom con contract um, with those KPIs built, built, built into it to ensure we get the service levels we, we had. One of the most interesting things that we were doing um, when we were um, negotiating the contract with, with Microsoft was our desire to say, oh no, we, we can't do any maintenance when there's a severe weather event go going on. That's, yeah, that, that's not okay, we, we don't do that. But then you get into the question of, well, where is the severe weather event? Is it over the data center that Microsoft own? Is it over where our people are? Is it over a significant pop, um, population center like, like London? At what point do you say you can't do the, the, ma the maintenance? And actually, if you're doing something special for when there's a severe weather, weather event, then you're not using your normal processes and so something could go wrong. So they really had to educate us um, as to how you do stuff in a, um, a more modern and cl cloudy approach, but yeah, so there, there was uncomfortableness on both sides in, um, in some of that. Um, uh, I was curious, uh, it sounds like, you know, you're achieving a, a large change, but to your users, it seems like a relatively small change. And so I'm, I'm thinking of the rat's nest diagram you yep. showed with the data flow. Uh, if it were a large change, that would have to adapt. Uh, if it's a small change, maybe it doesn't, you just transplant it directly. Is there a focus on adopting that or adapting that to a new uh, cleaner diagram with the cloud or? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, that 1.2 billion pounds is not all going to Microsoft. We, we kept a reasonable chunk um, back to essentially allow us to work downstream of that, that, su that supercomputer to fixing what, what I refer to as the, the, rat, the rat's nest. Um, yeah, this taking the opportunity of a once in a generational change to essentially drive through um, affecting some of our, our legacy systems and, and update them and, and modernize them. We're not going to get it all right. We're not going to completely fix that, but we should be able to make it a bit cleaner and a bit easier for people to get data through our system. But we felt attaching it to the supercomputer program was a good way essentially of both getting that funding and essentially tying it to, look, this is why it's important. The supercomputer is going to be generating so much more data and that's going to create a whole series of knock-on impacts if we don't sort it out. So speaking of the data flows, I was surprised that having chosen this Microsoft as a vendor, you were still sending data to AWS. Do you envision doing that, you know, sort of forever, or is that you feel like you have to do it now because that's what your your users want, but you'll get them used to using Microsoft's Azure instead, or or what? Yeah, so we're fully committed to using but using both clouds. We um, we want to make sure we're operating where our our consum consumers is, and that's not just in one cloud. That's going to be in different places. We get benefits from working with both the the cloud providers. They're good at different things in different spaces, um, but we absolutely it's it's painful to move that data around. Don't don't get me wrong, and we would prefer probably to to not do it. But the benefit we get out of of doing it for our consumers is that they can work where they, where they want to be. And then just one more follow-up. Um, if the data are, it sounds like at least some will be in both places, will they be represented the same way or will one be optimized for, you know, time series analysis and the other one for synoptic or, you know, any changes in how you actually uh, store and provide the data? Um, not intentionally at the moment. We're looking at providing them in the in the same way, 
but to, they, they've each got their own platforms where we're looking to make that available. So Azure has the planetary computer where they're making um, open uh, data sets available. AWS has um, ASDI, um, and we're looking at making our data sets available in both of those sorts of places. They've got slightly different requirements. You have to do slight, slightly differently, but we're not intentionally setting them out in different ways on different platforms. I, mean, I think this is a really long-term question. So at the end of 10 years, and you mentioned data, moving data is painful. Um, how do you have plan tra transition plans at the end? Um, yes, we do. Um, as part of the procurement, we specified that the provider had to um, enable us to exit from their, their platform um, and had to support us to, to doing that. Um, I'm very confident Microsoft had delivered us a good exit plan and are going to, to do that. Um, I'm sure they would like to never enact it, um, but we made sure that it was it was viable and will allow us to go to wherever we need to do. No, not online, okay. Well, let's thank our speaker once again. That was, a, that was a great talk. Thank you so much for inaugurating our return to in-person. Uh, now we need more speakers. So if in January or thereafter you want to speak or suggest speakers, let us know, please. Thank you.